Okay, it's five past four on my computer. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, last guest lecture on European values. Um, last in a, in a series. Um, my name is Helene Touquet. I'm uh, the holder of the Chair in European Values at the University of Antwerp. And the idea behind the Chair in European, European Values is to stimulate debate on European values in their diversity. And that is what we will be doing today with our very uh, honorable guest, uh, Gurminder Bambra from the University of Sussex, who is going to speak about colonialism, EU citizenship, and European values. Uh, as well as our uh, respondent from the Faculty of Law at the University of Antwerp, um, Tommaso Ferrando. Um, Gurminder Bamra is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies at the Department of International Relations School of Global Studies, University of Sussex. And she's also a fellow at the British Academy, um, who was elected in 2020. Um, Gurminder has written about her, her first monograph, Rethinking Modernity, Post-Colonialism and a Sociological Imagination, won the 2008 Philip Abrams Memorial Prize for the best first book in sociology. And uh, it addresses how with sociological understandings of modernity, the experiences and claims of non-European others have been rendered invisible to standard uh, frameworks of uh, sociology. And this is ring, also rings true to the memory politics of the European Union, of course. And this is also what we will be discussing today. Uh, her second book is called Connected Sociologies. And uh, this is a book from which different projects I have, I have developed, Gurminder. Maybe you can say something about it later on. But um, it's a, a, a book that tries to reconstruct uh, historical sociology at a global level. There's also an Instagram account uh, related to the project Connected uh, Sociologies uh, that I, I can really recommend that you can check out. Uh, Gurminder has also edited several interesting collections such as Silencing Human Rights with Robbie Shilliam, uh, a book on European cosmopolitanism, uh, and a book on decolonizing uh, the university, a, a much needed uh, book. She also is running a number of very interesting current projects, for example, on epistemological justice uh, and on reparations uh, and on the political economy of race and colonialism. Uh, and she's working on a project that is called States, Empires and Taxation with uh, Julia McClure. And she's going to talk about uh, this uh, topic of the, the silencing of the claims by non-European others within Europe and how that is connected to the crisis of European values. Um, Gurminder is going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we will have a re uh, invited a response by uh, my colleague Tommaso Ferrando from the University of Antwerp. He is my colleague at the Faculty of Law. Uh, Tommaso, Tommaso um, his, his, the research that he does focuses on uh, the links between law and food, uh, and he pays particular attention to the international dimension uh, and the implementation of local practices around food. Um, and he has a uh, is co-investigating a project called Food Security at the Time of Climate Change learning and sharing bottom-up experiences from the Caribbean uh, region. And he also works on the socio-legal and financial construction of green bonds. And outside of academia, he's been uh, the legal advisor of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food from 2016 to 2020. So we will proceed as follows. Um, Gurminder is going to give her talk, then we have the response of about 15 minutes, and then there is time for Q&A. We have about 20 minutes usually for Q&A. Uh, you are allowed to post your questions uh, in the Q&A button at the, um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, and I will try to uh, curate them and pass them on to, uh, to whoever you want to address. And you're, of 
obviously free. You don't need to wait until the Q&A session to post your questions. You can also do so uh, while our speakers are speaking. Gurminder, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for inviting me to contribute to this uh, lecture series. The talk that I'm going to give is around the idea of Europe's unfinished project, colonial histories and post-colonial reparations. And I'll start by saying that European social theory tends to define modernity, both as the realization of freedom and in Habermas's terms as an unfinished project. And in this sense, the colonial constitution of modernity comes to be displaced from such considerations and those who were dispossessed and made subordinate in the process are seen to have no place from which to participate in the development of freedom in their own right. So rather than seeing modernity as the unfinished project, in this talk I follow Nelson Maldonado Torres who has rather highlighted the unfinished project of decolonization that is at the heart of the modern world. So Europe, I suggest, is in urgent need of decolonization, and this can only happen by taking its colonial history seriously and explicitly working through their contemporary manifestations. The injustices which disfigure the world that we share in common can only be addressed through acknowledging the histories that have produced them, as well as the historiographies that have obscured them. I'll argue that we need to give up a commitment to the idea of European values as defining European history in favor of redressing the identified wrongs of the past through a commitment to epistemological justice and to material reparations. In sum, what I'd like to do today is to set out an argument generally for why history matters in the social sciences and why more specifically understanding our colonial past is necessary for understanding who we are and the pressing political issues that face us today. While I will go on to discuss these issues more broadly in terms of Europe and European values, I want to first set out the nature of the debate in Britain and how the parameters or limits of it have shifted in recent years. The Brexit years, if I may call them that, were premised on a narrow understanding of who we were that limited belonging to those who could demonstrate belonging to the history of the nation. The debates around reclaiming our national sovereignty failed to recognize that Britain had never been a nation, but that ever since the Act of Union in 1707 that had brought together the kingdoms of England and Scotland, the new entity, Britain, had always been an imperial state. While there may have been a national project at the heart of the imperial state, that state had been supported financially and otherwise through the labor, resources and taxes of its colonial subjects as much as its domestic ones. This understanding of a multicultural past is absent from most understandings of what it is to be British. But it is an understanding that dramatically came to the forefront during the initial period of the COVID crisis. What we saw during the beginnings of the pandemic was that we are a multicultural nation and perhaps more significantly that we couldn't actually function without our ethnic minority citizens and migrant populations, both settled and temporary. Indeed, it is precisely these populations that were disproportionately carrying the burden of maintaining the nation's health and lives under lockdown. Whether one looks at the NHS, the National Health Service, or at the key workers staffing supermarkets and corner shops, delivering food and other necessities, operating public transport, cleaning workplaces, collecting rubbish, and over the summer being chartered in to pick fruit and vegetables, these workers were disproportionately migrants, both from the EU and further afield, and also ethnic minority British citizens. One of the reasons that we suddenly became aware of them was that they were dying in disproportionate numbers and their deaths could not be hidden. Their faces were on the front pages of newspapers and across social media feeds. Their contributions to society, their integration within it 
was amplified by their deaths in service to us all. In contrast, the Brexit years had been defined by a narrowing vision of who constitutes the body politic and who ought to be considered the legitimate object of public policy. In other words, who belonged, who really belonged and who did not. By rethinking Brexit in the light of COVID, we might come to understand that alongside those represented as left behind, there were also many who had been left out. Left out, that is, from our understandings of who we are. What I want to go on to address now is precisely those who've been left out of our understandings of who we are and how and why it matters that we rethink the histories that have produced narrow parochial understandings of ourselves in favour of more expansive ones. While much post-colonial analysis is oriented to the Middle East and South Asia and decolonial studies focuses on South America, the Caribbean and to some extent Africa, the one part of the world most in need of such analysis is Europe itself. Europe, I suggest, is in urgent need of decolonization and this can only happen by taking its colonial history seriously and explicitly working through their contemporary manifestations. The world that was subjugated by Europe cannot examine issues in the present without taking into account how their past of having been colonized is central to these issues. Within Europe, however, there is no similar obligation. As Said has long noted, and I quote, on the one hand, we assume that the whole of history in colonial territories was a function of the imperial intervention. On the other, there is an equally obstinate assumption that colonial undertakings were a phenomenon marginal and perhaps even eccentric to the central activities of the great metropolitan centers." End quote. In other words, colonization was something that happened elsewhere and as such has no perceived bearing on contemporary European politics. This is the case both in terms of issues related to the national polity itself and also its relations to the rest of the world. The misunderstanding central to such assumptions is that the state within Europe was a nation state, when in fact it was an imperial state. Standard genealogies of the state within Europe tend to use the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia as central to the emergence and consolidation of the idea of national sovereignty and the political equality of states. This treaty brought to an end the 30 years war between Protestant and Catholic powers in Europe and it assigned each state exclusive authority within its territorial boundaries. The key issue, however, is that in the subsequent centuries, European states did not simply exercise their sovereignty within the territorial boundaries of the national state. They also exerted power and violence over territories and populations elsewhere. Sovereignty was only to be respected in relation to other European powers and was not regarded as significant to encounters with peoples and lands beyond Europe. Indeed, as Anthony Angie argues, the doctrine of sovereignty was itself explicitly a statement of the relation among European powers, and it allowed the exercise of sovereignty over non-European others as an expression of that sovereignty. In effect, it was oriented to this idea of a right to colonize. This explicitly legitimizes for Europeans the terms of an imperialism that would incorporate the non-European world into the ambit of European powers. One of the issues at stake here then is that core European states are understood as having a theoretical and conceptual integrity as nation states, and that what happens beyond their borders is not regarded as important to the approaches developed upon reflection of their ostensibly domestic activities. Such accounts, I argue, rest on the misunderstanding of these states being nations and having empires instead of more properly understanding them as being imperial states. To understand them as imperial states, 
would be to bring within a common frame of analysis events and processes that are otherwise incorrectly disaggregated. It would be to recognize the colonial processes upon which subsequent developments depended, and indeed to understand the constitutive nature of colonialism to states within Europe and ultimately to Europe itself. Not to do so is to reproduce an epistemology of separation and rupture that has no basis in historical evidence. And yet it does much to perpetuate a politics of division and resentment in the present, as I will go on to discuss. European colonialism was both a collective and an individual endeavor. This is not to suggest that it was the same across the continent, but rather that there were varieties of colonialism which overlapped and intersected across time to create the European colonial project. It was a project carried out by states, for example, Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, Germany, by trading companies in association with states, for example, the English East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, by heads of states, for example, Leopold, King of the Belgians, and by individuals and communities from populations across Europe. The latter through what 19th century German advocates called emigrationist colonialism. It was also following the work of Pio Hansen and Stefan Jonsson carried out by the project of European Union itself. According to its own narrative, the EU came about as a consequence of sovereign nation states entering peaceful relations with each other and deriving their legitimacy from sovereign peoples expressing their individual rights and freedoms. Such an articulation, however, fails to acknowledge European domination over much of the world through colonialism, dispossession, extraction, appropriation and enslavement as significant to that history or to its contemporary configuration. Specifically, it disavows examining the consequences of domination for the contemporary multicultural constitution of European societies. And in the process, it therefore disavows those societies. The initial processes of colonization in the new world were undertaken by private companies that were given charters to explore, to seek profits and to obtain lands while also making claims for jurisdiction and sovereignty in the name of various European monarchs, as well as the Pope. Early Spanish and Portuguese dominance in the New World was followed by British, French and Dutch involvement in colonial enterprises. Alongside these initiatives westwards, the establishment of East India companies within various European states led to financial ventures eastwards. These over time, at least for the English East India Company, also involved territorial conquest and rule over increasing parts of the Indian subcontinent. And from the 1660s onwards, sustained and systematic involvement in the trade in human beings from the African continent. I say all of this to make the point that the age of commerce that is recognized as a part of the history of European nations was less an age of commerce than an age of colonialism that has not been adequately recognized. It was an age that was followed by what in the standard literature has often been presented as the age of free migration. This refers to the 60 million Europeans who left their countries of origin across the long 19th century to make new lives and livelihoods for themselves on lands inhabited by others. This included those lands that we now know as the Americas, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, amongst others. While these areas were regarded erroneously as free soil by scholars such as Max Weber and John Hobson, there was no land to which Europeans moved that was not already inhabited and under sovereign claim by others, those we today call indigenous peoples. At least 7 million Germans moved to what was to become the United States in the North and to Brazil and Argentina in the South. Large scale Polish emigration led to over 2 million Polish people moving to the Americas with about 300,000 going to Brazil, another settler colony. 
Two million subjects of the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary traveled to the Americas, as did over eight million Irish people, including a million as a consequence of the mid-century famine induced by British colonial rule. By 1890, nearly a million Swedes, one fifth of the total Swedish population, were living in the lands colonized as the US. In addition, 13.5 million British people moved to white settler colonies across the globe. The official records of European governments in the 19th century underreport the full extent of such emigration because governments were unable or made no attempt to secure their borders against their own citizens. As such, the true scale of this movement is likely to be much more extensive. While the idea of Lebensraum was explicitly articulated in Germany in the late 19th century, expansionist policies for land and territory for one's own citizens had been central to the European colonial project for much longer. The perceived necessity of land for one's own population was the driver of a colonial expansion that dispossessed and eliminated populations both across the world and within Europe. Current hostility towards those who seek to come to Europe arises from within these same ideological frames. Within the metropole, this land is considered to be our land and not for sharing with others. Within settler colonies, this land is our land because we took it from others and made it our own. This is generally called progress as lower forms of society are replaced by the higher form of modern society. Just as people come to be organized into lower and higher races to justify both domination and replacement. There is a failure within our standard historical accounts to acknowledge these long standing colonial connections and the ways in which they were both organized along lines of domination and oppression and hierarchically constructed. This is particularly the case in terms of thinking about the ways in which race comes to define and to provide the justification for the hierarchies and inequalities created through colonialism and which continue to structure both academic and public debates. Such issues are central to questions of legitimacy and related fears of white replacement that are gaining traction in Europe today not just on the right, but also from figures ostensibly associated with the left. The fundamental assumption that is presented within such arguments is that the national patrimony that's available for distribution is precisely that, national. That is, it is wealth that has been generated through the activities of national citizens over time and whose use and distribution ought to be regulated for the people whose contributions and efforts it represents. Branko Milanovic, for example, arguing for the necessity of protecting the citizenship premium of nationals against the inward movement of migrants from poorer parts of the world, argues that rich countries accumulate wealth and transmit it to, met to the next generations of their citizens. We take it as normal, he argues, that there is a transmission of collectively acquired wealth over generations within the same nation and for the enjoyment of its national citizens. The failure to acknowledge the colonial histories that have made possible the wealth of European nations is precisely what enables and derives this politics of resentment and division. The violence of imperial rule and colonial settlement disappears from histories of the nation, happening as it does outside of the borders of the national state. At the same time as arguments about national sovereignty are used to securitize borders in the present against others who are said to invade. It is this long-standing association between an understanding of one's own citizens and subjects and a sense of entitlement to land occupied by others as well as claims that Europe itself is unable to sustain the presence of others, that aligns colonialism with 20th century fascism with contemporary European politics. What is needed to combat this is, to use Prasenjit Dwara's resonant phrase, to rescue history from the nation. As I've previously argued, 
standard understandings of European history and its normative claims to cosmopolitanism and the idea of European values rarely address those multicultural others who come to constitute European polities through imperial endeavors. European multiculturalism is not a phenomenon of the 1960s, but is rather associated with empire. In this way, European states have been multicultural for as long as they have been imperial. And yet the colonial past does not figure in the deliberations of Europe's intellectuals, as they argue for the idea of cosmopolitanism to animate and finish the European project of enlightenment. For example, Habermas's association of multiculturalism with what he calls post-colonial immigrant societies demonstrates a parochial understanding that limits the post-colonial to those who migrate to Europe and renders invisible the long-standing histories that connect them with Europe. In this way, the issues that reference to the post-colonial signifies are seen as beginning with the migration of peoples into Europe and carried solely by the non-European other. These multicultural others are not seen as constitutive of Europe's own self-understanding or as legitimate beneficiaries of the post-war social settlement that has emerged from its shared and connected histories of colonialism. The question this leads me to, to which I've always been led to, is the following. Why are our histories in common rarely presented as shared histories? And how does the ensuing disaggregation affect the ways in which both contemporary politics is configured and how we respond to the challenges posed? How are we, as academics, scholars, social scientists and historians, how are we complicit in the variable valuation of lives and experiences? At the very least in our failure adequately to address the omissions and silences in those discourses and in the understandings that we know to be inadequate and inaccurate. And what can we do about this? The histories we use as the basis from which to develop our concepts make a difference to the adequacy and efficacy of those concepts. This requires us, and here the us as social scientists in particular, to be more alert to questions of history and historiography, and both to the political economy and demographic diversity of who gets to produce knowledge of our past and the ways in which it shapes the possibilities of the present. In the context of thinking about British history and historiography, Richard Drayton looked at the writing of British imperial history within the Golden Triangle of London, Cambridge and Oxford. And he argued that this has for the most part been, and I quote, a patriotic enterprise where the past was ordered an ideological defense of contemporary British expansion. The historical narratives for the most part produced by historians are characterized by a denial or at least evasion of the role of violence and terror in the establishment and maintenance of empire. Instead, ideas of value and progress have more commonly been at the center of such historical accounts. Apart from the more recent work by historians such as David Anderson and Caroline Elkins, who look at the violence perpetrated by the British against the Mau Mau in Kenya, Drayton argues that, and again I quote, one is unable to point to a single historian employed at the golden triangle heart of the field who has made British colonial violence or plunder into his or her subject. Indeed, a powerful current in the present is precisely to offer a balance sheet of empire, something that is not done, for example, in relation to the German empire of the 1930s, but is deemed acceptable in relation to the longer British empire. The decolonization of Europe would require Europe to take its colonial history seriously. And this would require a methodological configuration, reconfiguration, as much as a substantive one. The problem, as I've suggested, rests in part in the prevalent notion of European states being nation states having empires, instead of more appropriately understanding what we call nation states as being imperial states, that is, empires. This is important because within much European scholarship, 
the question of the legitimacy of political rule is primarily discussed in terms of the nation. Since colonization and the establishment of imperial rule over others cannot be legitimated through such a discourse, it is usually evaded as a matter of relevant concern. In this way, scholars believe that it is possible to tell the histories of European states in national terms and to tell the histories of Europe in terms of the aggregation of these national histories. Yet these national histories spilled over their retrospectively ascribed boundaries and not to acknowledge this is also to fail to acknowledge the violence and domination associated with that spillage. The decolonization of Europe will only happen once the colonial histories of Europe are explicitly reckoned with, and Europe itself is understood to have been constituted by those histories in all their variety. The injustices consequent to these histories can further only be adequately addressed through acknowledging the histories that have produced them, as well as the historiographies that have obscured them. Europe is the wealthiest continent on the planet. Its wealth is an inheritance that derives from the very same historical processes that have left other places poor. Formal decolonization may have reduced the flow of wealth from elsewhere to Europe, but it has neither stopped it altogether, nor has there been any reparation for the earlier histories of domination, oppression, or extraction. The movement of peoples to coming here today is presented as a replacement of Europeans on their own soil. This fear of replacement is an irrational and dangerously incorrect echo of European practices in the past. If we are to be better than we were, we need to move beyond colonial arguments for Lebensraum and all newly expressed manifestations of race science. In his classic text, Exterminate All the Brutes, Sven Lindqvist says, and I quote, you already know enough. It is not knowledge we lack. What is missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. The conclusion I would suggest is that decolonizing Europe requires both epistemological justice and material reparations. Epistemological justice involves recognition of the knowledge claims of others in terms both of respect and reconstructive response, and it emerges from the perspective of connected sociologies that I have elaborated elsewhere. Material reparations would require to be worked through collectively, all the while taking heed of Emmy Cezaire's injunction that, and I quote, there are sins for which no one has the power to make amends and which can never be fully expiated. If we cannot fully expiate them, what could we nonetheless do? To return to my opening remarks, arguments for a multicultural society are organized around desires for inclusion and equality for a society that works for us all. It is one that acknowledges that it is precisely the multicultural histories of empire that provide the legitimacy, should it be needed, for multicultural Britain. And what is true of Britain is also true of Europe more generally. Those who refuse multiculturalism refuse this history and wish to exclude and dominate in the name of imagined white nations and imaginaries of national sovereignty. This framing is devoid of any understanding of the histories that have produced us and the connections that have long sustained us. Brexit and related movements of populism across the continent are about imagining ourselves separately from and in opposition to those who actually enable our lives and livelihoods. What would it mean to see ourselves as a whole country and to address the socioeconomic inequalities that COVID-19 has laid bare and that Brexit and related populist movements would exacerbate? Perhaps it would be to recognize the contribution made by low paid workers and raise the living and minimum wage. It could be to promote fairer taxes, including higher taxes for the better paid and to address issues of tax evasion, 
It could be to understand that our support for countries we previously dominated as reparations rather than as charitable aid and to increase the amount that we give. There is something truly puzzling about European scholars' failure to address colonialism as constitutive of their societies and as constitutive of every aspect of their possibilities of being. Perhaps the explanation for this omission rests in the fact that colonialism and enslavement led to the betterment of European societies directly at the expense of the lives, livelihoods and environments of others. And people don't wish to reckon with what the consequences of proper accounting would open up. In contrast, I argue, and with this I'll conclude, that a properly critical analysis, a decolonial project of and for Europe, would offer us the possibility of better understanding our shared past so that we could more appropriately construct a world in which all of us could live well. The question I'll leave you with is do all of us want a world that works for all of us? Thank you, Gurminder. That was very, very powerful. Um, I want to invite Tommaso for his response. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me and thanks a lot for the opportunity of uh, assisting to, to such a powerful and uh, call to action. And I think that the urgency that Professor Bambra was putting in the, in the talk about the, the need to decolonize and the need to take the colonial past seriously is something that uh, I hope that can resonate with all of us and that will uh, resonate even stronger in the in the coming days and the coming weeks and, uh, and months. So my, my response is, is mainly a, a reflection or a reaction to, to what I listened. And uh, as of course, all of us, we, we participated, I, I listened from my own position. And so I think that it's pretty clear from, from the image that I'm projecting through the camera, but the, the position that I'm, that I'm talking from is definitely the position of someone who is benefiting from this history of, of colonialism and imperialism that Professor Bamba has been discussing on top of having been benefiting from, from patriarchy as, as the term of reference of how society has been, has been constructed and from this narrative of, of white supremacy and the false premises of, of cosmopolitanism. Also being, being from Italy, I, I have benefited and my country has benefited directly from the movement of migration towards the, the terra nullius of land that was available for for co-citizens, for people coming from my, from my country, and actually the, the, the migration that uh, took place in different phases of the history of Italy has been constructive of the society that we have today and has also uh, provided opportunity for, for the society in Italy, for the, for the country itself not to, not to collapse. I also listened to the, to the talk with uh, a lot of enthusiasm and interest because uh, I've been lucky enough and privileged enough to uh, start in a process of, of personal and, and academic attempt of, uh, of unlearning and relearning and really about uh, concentrating on, on, on myself and the relationship of what I'm doing and the person that I am with this uh, history of colonialism and history of, of imperialism that is uh, silenced and, and marginalized uh, when, we, when we learn as, uh, as students and we learn how to be citizens and, and definitely trying not to make the same mistake as someone that is now uh, an educator and is operating within uh, the higher education system. Um, I really appreciate a lot of points that uh, have, been, have been raised by, by Professor Pamra and, uh, and really this invitation to, to rethink our own epistemic stance and, and, and the role that we give to, to history and, and to the colonial project in our daily lives and in the way in which we, we see the world around us. And I will try to use uh, an example that is closer to my field of research, which is that of the um, injustices uh, that characterize the, the contemporary food system and the history of the contemporary food system to, to explain a little bit what I think uh, rethinking uh, the, the epistemic standpoint could, uh, could mean for our daily practices and for the way in which we see something like food, which uh, hopefully we enjoy and engage with on a, on a daily basis. Um, I really appreciate this, this idea of, of generating uh, or calling for self-awareness, but also to make sure that uh, the decolonial turn and, and the decoloniality and decolonization are taken seriously within, within academia. And I, and I hope that uh, we will have enough time uh, during the Q&A to, to bring also the conversation closer to all of us and, and, and in the context of the higher education structures where we are uh, 
operating and really having worked in the in the United Kingdom for for some years and having been part of this conversation also on the other side of the of the channel, I think that there is a lot that we uh, on this part of, uh, of of Europe we can we can learn and that we can engage with and collaborate with with uh, with activists and academics and academic activists that are operating on the other side of the of the channel. So my starting point is Professor Bambra reminder that, that the decolonization of Europe will only happen once the colonial histories of Europe are explicitly reckoned with and Europe itself is understood to have been constituted by those histories in all the varieties. And I think that that's a, really a, a call for change in the way in which we look at the, at the present. So it is my, my feeling and my perception that too often we, we look at the events and we look at what is happening around us if they were happening in the, in the moment, if it was just a, a matter of here and now without considering how much the violence and the subordination and the marginalization and the, and the oppression that we see around us are actually rooted in, in the past and the legacy of, of colonialism is still present, although in different forms. And I'm really referring here to the notion of, of coloniality that Walter Mugnolo and other decolonial um, academics from Latin American activists are, are utilizing. And I'm not going to you know, talk about them in, in, in details because these are not uh, situations that, uh, that are close to my, my area of, of, of research, but I think that this importance of decolonizing our gaze is, is crucial when we look at the massive violation of human rights that are happening on a daily basis in the Mediterranean um, to protect fortress Europe, like the thousands uh, of lives of brown and black people that have been taken while crossing, crossing the sea and, and trying to, to reach Europe. Uh, transforming the Mediterranean in the, in the largest graveyard in the world. Um, how do we look at that? Do we look at that through the continuation of historical violence that Europe is perpetrating in order to protect itself, not really caring about what happens elsewhere? And I think that there are several reasons uh, to think that that's the way in which we should be looking at that. I'm thinking about what is happening right now in Sheikh Jarrah, in, in Gaza, and, and throughout Palestine, and what has been happening since 1948, and the way in which the, the European Union official position is to call for international humanitarian law as the space where to resolve the conflict with two, two parties exercising violence, which is using this notion of sovereignty and this notion of international law in a very strategic way in order to deprive the occupation and deprive the, the condition of, of oppression and apartheid of its true political, political nature, but is also moving away or not focusing on the direct support uh, in terms of political support, legal support, and financial support that a lot of European countries have been providing to, to the state of Israel in, in the last decades. And thinking also about something that unfortunately we all had to, to deal with for the last 18 months, which is the management of the of the coronavirus crisis, and in particular, the way in which uh, the vaccine has been rolled out or not rolled out. And we are today in a situation where high income countries, and in particular, the European Union, have been guaranteeing access to their citizens, and they have been having the possibility of providing more than 53% of the vaccine that has been produced around the world, depriving the rest of the population, low income countries and billions of people around the world, from the possibility to access in the vaccine. But on top of that, not only occupying and monopolizing the vaccine, but also strongly opposing the possibility of waiving patents rights and guaranteeing the, the, the opportunity to countries all over the world to produce the vaccine at a lower cost and in higher quantities. What is that approach to property rights? What is that approach to the vaccine? And what is that very introverted approach to, to health? Uh, if not a continuation of the historical way of in which Europe has been seeing itself and the rest of the, of the world. So these are situations that have been happening in the last weeks, and I think that on, for all of them, we, we could uh, reflect and, and really try to put in practice what Professor Bambra has been asking us to, to do and to think about epistemic justice and restoration. But in the few minutes um, that I still have, I would just like to bring some some two cents or, or some considerations about the area that I'm most familiar with, which is that of the, of the food system. And, and something has already been mentioned by Professor Bambra regarding the, 
the way in which oppression and othering and marginalization of the non-white and the non-male continues today in the, in the food system. And we saw that during the COVID-19 crisis where tens of people, hundreds of people all over Europe working on the farms, farm workers mainly with a migration background, they were exposed to the virus, they were exposed to death, they were exposed to the hardest situation possible without being seen and without being um, treated or given any form of care because they didn't exist for the state and they didn't exist for, for Europe. Um, but unfortunately, uh, if we adopt this decolonial perspective towards the food system, we realize that it's not only that, it's not only about the migrants, it's not only about those that are at the same time subordinated uh, in the, in, in, on the fields and producing our food. But this is the way in which the, the food system has been constructed and the European food system has been constructed in particular. And, and, and the examples about the, the way in which marginalization and silencing operate in the, in the food system are numerous. So we can think about the people who are not having access to healthy diets and healthy food, like these are people who are living in the so-called food deserts, and these are the same uh, black and brown people that have been historically pushed out from the from the uh, from the wealthy neighborhoods and put in condition where life is uh, almost unbearable. Um, black and brown people represent the majority of the riders, those that have been making consumption of food at home like possible during the, the eighteen months, and these are people. Who are paid less than minimum wage, they're not considered as employees, they're not provided any form of, of healthcare, and these are among the, the most vulnerable and, and the most precarious jobs that we have in our contemporary society. And these are black and brown people, um, because these are the people that can be exploited and that can be paid the least. And these are the providers of reproductive care and paid labor. This is surplus population that actually makes our food system possible and that on the one hand is considered to be essential because without them we would not have food on our tables, we would not have had the possibility of feeding ourselves during uh, not only the last 18 months of pandemic but throughout history but still they are completely invisible and subordinated so this double violence of the way in which we can build the other as invisible or superfluous and then exploiting it for the construction of our own society. But that's even just one part of, of, of the way in which our interaction with, with food is, uh, is uh, intrinsically connected with the colonial project and the imperialistic project. And if we look at the authorship of uh, colleagues like Phil McMichael or Harriet Friedman, we really see that the construction of the global food system that is rooted in the colonial enterprise and the, in the imperialistic project is the construction of the European Union that we, that we know. And I'm not saying that just because I'm obsessed with the food system and I'm really into uh, looking and studying at this interaction, but there is one example that I think is, is the most telling and it's the most evident and eye-opener, which is thinking about the source of energy that was needed in order to guarantee um, that workers during the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom could actually provide all the energy and all the efforts that was needed in order to make Great Britain what Great Britain was. Well, that source of energy was the sugar that was harvested and produced by slaves and enslaved people in the plantation in Latin America. Without that sugar, without that access to the colonial project, without that access to, to that food, without the role of the colonies and without the subordination of cheap labor of slaves, we would not have Europe as we have it today. We would not have had our dream of modernity. We would not have had our dream of progress. So if that's the way in which the food system has been built, if the, con the con connections with the colonial project are, are rooted in, in what we have today, both in the daily practices and both in this idea of the universal food system, what really scares me and what really worries me is that the new trend that we are seeing, that we are envisaging, which is this idea of greening the food system, but also greening our economy and, and transforming our economy in a way that is more sustainable, will follow the same patterns of silencing, invisibility, epistemic, epistemic dominance, 
and not really going into the direction of, of taking uh, colonialism seriously, of taking the responsibility seriously, and taking the responsibility of Europe in particular as the core building block of the future that we want to do. And that is visible with the, with the food system, but I think that is also visible with another policy and another program that the European Union has been launching during the, the pandemics, which is the, the European Green Deal. Uh, this idea uh, that Europe is pushing for structural responses to the problems of, of contemporary society, pushing for a new growth strategy that, and I quote, sets out ambitions to transform the EU into a modern, resource efficient, and competitive economy. So the European Green Deal is a lot about Europe, but it's also about the rest of the world. And, and the European Commission goes on in describing the, the Green Deal as an international effort to promote economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable development to address the planetary crisis, and in particular, to fight climate change. And, and that's the third point, and I think the most important, the sort of narrative or, that the European Union is building around the Green Deal. The aim is to promote the implementation of ambitious environment, climate, and energy policies across the world. But so what I'm worried about, and what I think is, 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 is crucial here, is that if we don't adopt this decolonial approach, if we don't reckon with the past, if we don't understand the role that imperialism has had in the construction of Europe, what we're going to be doing is just present similar patterns, but in a different disguise, under different clothes that may be greener clothes, or they can be more glittery clothes, but it's always going to be about the epistemic superiority of Europe, who is promoting its own vision of the future and pushing and nudging the rest of the world, and in particular the global south, into doing that, because Europe knows better, because we are modern, because we do it better, so everyone else should do that with us according to what we are recommending. And if they are actually in need of resources and in need of money, that should not be a problem because the European Union framework is already there, providing access to more debt, more finance, and more resources that the countries in the global south and uh, actors in the global south can borrow in order to implement these, these resources, in, in order to implement these, uh, these programs, sorry. So if we don't really challenge the premises and if we really don't challenge the way in which we look at the future without uh, reckoning with the past and without taking the past seriously, what we're gonna create is just gonna be another phase of this uh, uninterrupted colonial project or this continuous colonial project and nothing to do with the decolonial endeavor and the decolonial priorities that we all have to, uh, to deal with and that we definitely have to take seriously. And that has to do with the progress the projects themselves, but even more importantly, when it comes to the Green Deal, it has to do with the role that the Global South and the resources in the Global South will play in making the Green Deal possible. We could open here a, a new, a different Pandora box of, of another topic, but that is not going to be the transition that Europe is envisaging in the European Green Deal under the conditions and the objectives that the European Union is envisaging without a massive access to resources, in particular minerals, that are located in the global south. So can we truly think that the European Green Deal and the, the green future of Europe can be a just and decolonial future if what we're doing is simply relying more and more again, over and over again, on the resources, the nature, the nature, and the minerals that are located in the global south, and continuing considering and operating with regards to the global south as if it was just a provider of the resources that we need. But I think that's that's not the case. And, and I really hope that the more talks we have about decolonization and decolonization of our imagination and decolonization of the narratives that we are producing, uh, the least these projects will go in the direction that they seem to be undertaken in the last years, where they have not been sufficiently challenged from this perspective, they're not sufficiently challenged from the overall historical perspective and from the risks that they represent in terms of reproduction of the same power dynamics and subordination dynamics. So, in light of time, I'm, unfortunately, I cannot uh, really enter into the, the argument of, of decolonization of uh, higher education and university, but I hope that we will have the possibility also through the question and answer uh, 
to go there because that's something that Professor Bamba has, has been writing about and working uh, a lot on and in, in a very uh, powerful, powerful way. So I think that we could all benefit a lot from, from her intervention also on this point. Um, the last two comments or the last two reflections that I, that I want to make are um, regarding the importance of looking backward and understanding our colonial past in order to create solidarity. And then a question or a, an invitation about being, uh, being brave. With, for what concerns solidarity, I think that the point that uh, emerged clearly from Professor Bamba's intervention is that uh, this multiculturalism that has characterized the history of, uh, of the imperial project of, of Europe uh, by not being seen as such as creative fragmentation, division and separation. And today we, we see that in uh, a lot of attempts to, to convey the frustration, the poverty and the, and the marginalization that some um, white European people are, are experiencing and white working class in particular are experiencing against the other, against the migrant, against someone that is coming from elsewhere, against someone with a migration background that is never really considered to be European. Well, I think that that is definitely part of the project and that definitely has been part of the way in which uh, imperialism has operated also uh, in, our, in our mind. Uh, and that is one of the aspects that we have to, to work more on and, and really try to create solidarity by demonstrating that there is convergence in this sufferance and this marginalization rather than oppositions and, uh, and tension. And again, going back to the, to the case of, of the food system and what happened during the industrial revolution, um, it was impossible to create solidarity between the slaves in the plantation and the white working class in the, in the Great Britain, although they were all protesting against the same thing. They were all protesting against the system that was treating them cheaply, that was exploiting them, that was working, overworking them at different levels, but they had somehow the same enemy. But solidarity wasn't built because there was not the capacity or the possibility or not a strong capacity or possibility to create the level of self-awareness and reciprocal awareness. And I think that if we look seriously at history and if we look seriously at the colonial past that has constructed um, Europe and that continues today with the, with the coloniality that Europe is reproducing, we really have to be capable of creating this solidarity, of creating these networks and generate situations of alliance where we can walk together rather than being fragmented, each one of us in our uh, silos and with our own uh, quests. And the last point is uh, to take uh, the quote of, of Lindquist that Professor Bambra mentioned about the fact that what is missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. So I think that there is no doubt that uh, we're living in a crucial moment. I'm sure that a lot of people have been saying that right now and a lot of people have been saying that through our history, because it always looks like it's, we're living in a crucial moment for the world and that uh, we're living at a, in a game-changing situation. But definitely the, uh, the presence at the same time of the COVID pandemic, this subversion of, of the status quo and, and business as usual, mixed or joined with the fact that in nine years, according to the IPCC, uh, we, we will be too late in order to prevent the, the warming of the planet to the point of, of no return. Well, we are now in a moment where probably uh, we still have an opportunity and we probably have a last chance in order to rethink the premises of Europe, to rethink the premises of Europe as a region, but also to, to rethink the premises of Europe, Europe as a universal player, as a global, as a global player. We have to start from what Professor Bamba has been mentioning about its history and, uh, and the imperial nature of, of Europe. So we, we definitely have to be, to be brave. And when I say we, uh, I'm referring to people in position of privilege, like myself, um, and in particular, all of us who, who play a role as, as educators. Um, I think it's, it's crucial to start from, from what we teach and, to, and from the messages that we convey. And probably one of the reasons why in academia there is not yet enough, or at least in, in history and other disciplines there is not yet enough, is because the educators of the past did not do the job the way we should be doing the job, which is by creating 
strong awareness and, and strong consciousness. So I think that it's important for all of us to be, to be strong allies, uh, to listen to the voices of the billions of people who are speaking out and, and who are silenced, who are oppressed, who are put in the corner, who are not, uh, who are not seen. Uh, definitely what we cannot do is to be silent, complicit, um, and we cannot accept that the burden of social change that is needed, necessary, and extremely urgent will be once more on the shoulders of the same people that colonialism and imperialism have relegated to a position of subalternity. And with that, I, I really thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, uh, Tommaso, for your uh, response. I, th I th think definitely your examples of the food system and the Green Deal offered a perfect illustration of uh, Professor Bambra's claims uh, on the need for decolonization. So thank you for that. Um, we now have about 25 minutes for Q&A, so uh, pe the, uh, people who are participating, who are, have been attending, can post their questions in, in the Q&A window that is at the bottom of the, um, of the screen. And you can address uh, questions both at uh, Professor Fernando and Professor Bambra. I can have a question otherwise. Probably I could have asked it. Uh, of course, I yes. I can break the to ice. warm up the room. Yes, please. <laughs> no, because I, I mentioned it already a couple of times. And I think that uh, the work that Professor Bamber has been doing on, on decolonizing education like, is, uh, is crucial for conversations that we have been having or start to, to have also in, in Belgium. And there are some, some examples and some experiences that are, that are, that are happening recently. So I would like to, to hear from, from, from you what uh, kind of the um, highest hurdles have been, or what do you envisage as, the, as the, the most problematic steps to take? And who do you see are, are the allies when we, when we talk about decolonizing education? Okay. I mean, thanks for the question. And thank you also for the comments. I mean, I agree very much with, with the arguments that you were putting forward. And I think there's a lot to discuss in relation to those themes as well, particularly around climate change, food colonialism, and also our contemporary political moment as well. I mean, how these patterns continue to reproduce over time is, is quite uh, extraordinary. Um, in terms of thinking about issues of decolonization of higher education, I mean, partly as I was sort of saying, you know, I think that there's a need both for epistemological justice and material reparations. And so the work of decolonizing within the academy is nothing if it's divorced from an understanding of what decolonization in the world might actually look like. And to that extent, it's thinking about how we're located within the academy and what is the work that we can do there. For me, the task has been to think about the ways in which there are particular foundational concepts and understandings within the social sciences, for example, and how these have been constructed and developed on the basis of an understanding of history, which is very parochial in that it's uh, an understanding that thinks of the Industrial Revolution as an event internal to Europe, as opposed to thinking about it in terms of these global connections, in, in part, you know, linking back to what you were saying, that in the work of Sydney Mintz, sugar fueled the Industrial Revolution without sugar, workers could not work at the pace that they were needed to work in order to, to manage that new system. And so part of the work is around sort of rethinking those concepts, thinking that if we engage with a colonial history, how would that colonial history then enable us to reshape these concepts and categories? And that's work in the realm of epistemology. And then there's the argument for material reparations. And that's something that I don't think we've had much of a discussion of within Europe, in part, again, because Europe doesn't think that it has anything that it needs to make amends for. And so, you know, it's produced the modern world. It doesn't understand itself as having produced the colonial modern world. And what would that difference then enable? 
So there are a few people like Hilary Beckles, who's based in the University of West Indies in the Caribbean, who wrote a book called Britain's Black Debt, who's made an explicit argument for reparations. Shashi Tharoor, the former Indian sort of MP and so on, who's also um, written a book on inglorious empire and makes an explicit argument for reparations um, in relation to British colonization of India and so on. But these are books that are written, if you like, from outside Europe. I don't know of a book from within Europe that's making that argument. So I think there's much work that needs to be done to, to and in both senses, really. I mean, the patterns of our disciplines have been established over centuries on an understanding of European history as an internal event to try and shift that is quite a mammoth task. And it requires a lot of us to work on it together to try and create a new framework through which we understand the, these issues and so on. So I don't think it's straightforwardly an issue of allies or those who are um, standing in the way, if you like, it's more an issue of how long it takes to persuade people of the need for things to be different. And that's an ongoing, conversation. Can I follow up? I, I, I could continue asking thousands of questions because I'm, I'm super curious, but I, I don't want to monopolize and you know, I tend to. But there is a, a passage in your in your talk where you, when you mentioned the fears of, of white replacement. Mm -hmm. And that is something that clearly arose in some conversation that I've been having in, in the university. So how to do with how to deal with that? I know that there is not a sort of secret ingredient, but where where would you take that? So your 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 take on that kind of argument? I mean, it's an interesting one because, in a sense, it's something that you know. I mean, I'm I don't do psychology. I'm not a Freudian or a Lacanian, and so on. But it would be quite interesting to have a sort of psychological analysis of this, given that. Europeans for the last 200 years or more have gone around the world and literally replaced societies. And there is no equivalent movement of people coming into Europe at all. I think over the last few years, the number of uh, successful asylum claims, for example, is under 1% or something of the whole, you know, 0.039% of the population. So there's no question of any sort of empirical substance to such a claim what is that anxiety based on because it's not empirically substantiated and what would need to be done to address it i would want to also sort of you know think about it in a different sort of way as well which is that there's an idea that what europe has it has established through its own efforts and its own labor and that that's one of the reasons why we shouldn't share with others because they haven't contributed to building up the resources that are currently at our disposal. And yet, if you look at the case of Britain, and I appreciate Britain's a different sort of case, but I, I, I could and would make the argument across Europe that there is no institution within Britain that has not been funded in significant part by the wealth of empire. And not just the wealth in terms of the extraction of resources, but also recent research I've been doing has been looking into issues of taxation. So colonial subjects in India paid taxation, which went to the government in Westminster at a time when the white working class and, and much of the middle class in Britain were not paying taxes. And so when we have arguments about the welfare state in the present, and people say, oh, well, you can't have access to the welfare state because your ancestors haven't paid in, it's like, well, actually, my ancestors from India likely were paying tax at a time when yours weren't, if you're claiming to be working class in relation to this. And we can map this historically. And in fact, it's quite well documented that taxes from the colonies were used in order to mitigate the taxes of people domestically so that people paid less tax in Britain because of colonial taxation. And that's why even though I agree with the, the argument you're making sort of 
theoretically and so on around solidarity and the enslaved should have the same interests as, as the white working class within Europe, actually the conditions of the working class in Europe were enhanced through coerced and enslaved labor and through colonial taxation. So they don't actually have an interest in getting rid of colonialism because colonialism makes the life of the working class in Europe better. And that's something that Du Bois has argued, that uh, the other by Neroji has argued, you know, there's a long history of scholarship on this, but it doesn't get dealt with. I think in part because people are committed to a Marxist frame around thinking uh, analyses of capitalism. Whereas I would argue that what we need is to think that there is no way that capitalism can come into being except through colonialism. So what would a colonial global economy look like? And what would the possibilities of solidarity in the context of understandings of a colonial global economy open up? And so in that sense, I think that, you know, there are all these things going on that, that we need to sort of think about much more thoroughly. I, I totally agree with you, and I think that's uh, the point that you're making about colonialism as a pacification tool for, for what was happening in, in Europe and, and the welfare state is, is definitely, and, and the racist and colonial nature of capitalism is, is definitely well present in my, in, my, in my mind, and I hope it is also in the people who are, are listening um, today. I think the point that I was making about solidarity does not imply that redistribution, reparation, and, and responsibility for the past should be taken into account and it's actually happening. So I think that that call for reparation and, and, and restitution should come from different sources. And I'm, and I'm worried that sometimes, again, like coming from my own perspective and my own positionality, sometimes there is this feeling of, well, we have nothing to do with that. We are not involved in that. It's not our struggle, right? So it's, it's not something that we should be involved. And, and so I'm worried that it could lead somehow to to a de de linking of of the privilege in the context of the of the fight for for decolonization and, and racial justice. Uh, I yeah, I want to invite the participants again to not be shy and to post their questions in the Q and A. Uh, otherwise, I think Thomas and I can continue to ask questions. Um, uh, I wondered about the what you think about the feasibility of, of material reparations. Um, and I was thinking about that because I'm teaching politics of memory. And so uh, politics of memory in Europe. So a lot of that is about the centrality of the Holocaust and then kind of Eastern Europe coming up with their version of anti-totalitarianism. And then we had a class about the complete lack of, of memory of colonialism at the EU level, you know, it's completely erased. And then there's all, all sorts of erasures, the erasures of the resistance to colonialism and, you know, all sorts of uh, narratives that were, that are not there, simply not there. And we also highlighted, or we talked about the, um, uh, the, the Dirk Moses' thesis, thesis on the, the racial century. So the connection between what happened in the colonies and then how that led into the Holocaust as it were. So, um, and then um, in relation to that, we were discussing, no, it's a bit of a long story. We were talking about the, uh, the, 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 um, the Herero in, in Namibia uh, who were asking for reparations. And this has been a huge, very long process with, with Germany actually being the country that has gone through a, a, a process of dealing with the past. And that is really an example in Europe, you know, all of the countries look up to that. This is the way of dealing with the past. But then when you look at this genocide that happened in 1904 and how long it is taking to say, okay, uh, reparations are in order and now the, I think the last conflict is that uh, Germany is not willing to use the word reparations and the Namibians want them to use the word reparations so my students were asking why what is the problem why are they speaking about reparations we're thinking I guess it's some 
pro probably there's an issue that there were reparations for Jewish families uh, after the Holocaust, and that costs a lot of money. So the whole colonial issue would open up the, the question of how huge would that be? And then I thought, isn't, isn't the basis of this, aren't we actually just talking about racism? Isn't that the real problem? That there's no willingness to pay reparations to people who are not white? I mean, that's a very complicated sort of issue. I mean, perhaps one way of thinking about it or the way in which I think about the issue of reparations is that I'm a social scientist, so I'm not interested straightforwardly in history. I'm interested in the present. I'm interested in the patterns of inequality that configure our world in the present. And I would argue that almost all forms of inequality in the present can be traced to particular sorts of colonial histories. And so if we're concerned about injustices in the past, the best way to address those past injustices is to address inequalities in the present. The wealth that was extracted from places like India and the Caribbean was used to develop things, institutions in Britain. It was used to fund the National Health Service, the Education Service, Cambridge and Oxford Colleges, public schools, all this sort of stuff was funded through that wealth. That wealth was the taxes and the resources of these other people who then weren't able to use that wealth to establish their own health systems or their own education systems. And in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see what consequence that has in terms of places that have decent healthcare and systematic coverage versus those places that don't. And one of the reasons those places don't is because the wealth that they might have used to establish it was siphoned off to develop institutions here. So the arguments of those, you know, there's a group within the West Indies called CARICOM, the Caribbean Community for Reparations. And this isn't necessarily the language they use, but the way in which I interpret what they're calling for is a form of social democratic reparations. They're arguing for th that, that this wealth was unjustly taken from them so that they couldn't develop social democratic institutions and they want reparations to be able to establish healthcare or to you know enhance their healthcare, their education systems, their roads, their lighting, their art galleries, everything that, that you might sort of want. And so in that sense, I think that we can make an argument for global redistribution that also acknowledges, you know, global redistribution would also require national redistribution because it's not as if the wealth that was extracted through colonialism necessarily trickled down in the colonies either. So you do have a situation where you have poverty and inequality also at the colonial center, but you can't, the way in which that has been addressed up until now has been to extract from the colonies in order to mitigate the conditions of those at the lowest uh, rungs of society within the metropole. But if we were to argue for redistribution on a global level, that would necessarily include national redistribution. And so we won't have to pit people against each other, but we could recognize how this inequality has been generated and then be generous in our considerations of how we address that inequality by having an inclusive argument for how we, we um, tackle these things. In terms of race and colonialism, I would always make the argument, and in part, it's, you know, to think about inequality as a consequence of particular structures and processes that have come into place that have benefited some people and not others. Whilst that maps largely onto race and the production of racial inequalities, it doesn't map completely onto it in the sense that you have elites within places that had formerly been colonized who collaborated with the colonizers and are now themselves in positions of wealth and, and privilege and, and so on. So I would rather focus on the colonial processes that produce inequality and keep the focus on the address of inequality. And if in the present we focus on addressing socioeconomic inequality, we will, by virtue of doing that, also address racial inequality to the extent that these correlate and they do. But it's just a more inclusive way
of making the argument, which gets to what it is that we want to address, but without all like the really arguments yeah. that can that can also come up in relation to that. I see that there is a question that was a question by, but I, I don't know what the name is of the person. CD Dungu is the uh, short form. Uh, there are claims with regard to decolonizing education that science is objective. What is your opinion on this claim? On science being objective? I mean, so it. it so it shouldn't be decolonized, I assume, because well, it's exactly objective. Yeah. Well, I mean, we also have to look at what science is used for. So science doesn't exist as pristine knowledge in the world. Scientific advances are made in order to do things with the science. And so in a way, we need to think about the way in which science has been mobilized in the very extractive processes of colonization, the resource extraction, the, the sort of the green revolutions as well in particular sorts of ways, which have um, made lands over time less fertile than they might have been and all this sort of stuff. And so I think we always need to think about what is the science for, who is involved in the production of science and in the benefits of that science. We see it at the moment with the, the failure to waive the patents on the COVID vaccine in order to enable populations around the world to be able to manufacture and utilize the vaccine against. And we know that we can't address COVID nationally. We can only address it globally. And yet still there is such a commitment to vaccine nationalism and, and big farmer and all that sort of stuff that stops us doing what would be ultimately in our own benefits to do it. So, you know, I mean, that's not straightforwardly an answer, but it's just to say that science itself is produced within social relations and those social relations also shape what we understand science to be. And so in that sense, we could have discovered a cure for malaria by now. Apparently we sort of, a new vaccine has just come about that might, uh, help in that and who will benefit from it. Thank you. There's a, a question by Jo Shaw um, and she's saying it's a, it's a more much it has a focus on the UK instead of on European values but that's not an issue that's not a problem of course. Uh, do you think it's coincidental that there is such a massive reaction of culture wars? precisely at the time when decolonization seems to be gaining some traction in the UK. And I think I could say that, that this is also the case in other countries in Europe, especially in the universities. In terms of timing, is it just coincidental because we happen to have the type of government we do have, or do you think there is something relating to these movements and shifts together? I mean, I think it's sort of, um... It is interesting to think about how intense the backlash has been in the context of the making of these arguments. And it's not even as if these arguments necessarily have a massive public resonance. It's just that there have been some public events which have highlighted some of these arguments and these claims. And then the backlash has just been, you know, extraordinary. And I think it points to how invested people are in this idea that empire had been something that was good in the world. Because every debate within Britain is that if you don't say that empire was good in the world, you at least have to talk about the benefits of empire in relation to what was problematic about it. You're not ever allowed to simply make the argument that the empire is a problematic uh, form when the British Empire has been uh, problematic. And it's so I think partly there's a, a sense of investment that we made the modern world and who are you to tell us that it isn't as good as we claim it to be. And secondly, there are material investments in it precisely through the issues of reparations and compensation, because if it was accepted that everything about Britain is consequent to colonialism, then what would that do to the politics of A, trying to keep people out of Britain, B, failing to pay any sort of aid or reparations to other places, C, to recognize the connections that 
you know, constitute the globe within which we live and, and so on. It would have an implication for the very politics that determine us and our politics in Britain at the moment are deeply authoritarian. And there's a conjunction of a form of nationalism with a form of socialism, which I'll leave you to put them together and discover what it is that is happening in Britain at the moment. And I think that we need to be very alert to these shifts and to think about what is needed to A, hold the line, B, push back and C, try and create something different. But we see people doing that around the world. It's also here. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that the question about science being objective was by uh, Charles Dungu from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. Um, thank you. If anyone else has any questions, I think we, we can take five more minutes maybe. So if anyone has a final question, please feel free to post it either in the chat or uh, in the Q&A. Um, if not, I, I mean, we've been talking about decolonizing education and the role of educators. How, what could we do in practice to, I, th I think, well, I mean, we have all these associations that we go to and big conferences, but there's probably also a need for epistemological justice across disciplines. How, how could we group people together who are interested in decolonizing across different disciplines? We're all in our little silos, as Tommaso is also saying. I mean, a couple of things that I've done as practical initiatives. One is there's something called the Global Social Theory website. So if you just Google Global Social Theory, it's a website. And it came out of the sense of having taught social theory for many years and having conversations with people about how do we broaden our understanding of what theory is and who theorizes. And, you know, I have no wish to, to make the argument that people in the rest of the world think. I think it should be taken as basic that people across cultures, across time have thought about the world and thought about how we live in the world. But our understanding of who theorists are is very particular. And so what this site does is bring together short accounts of different people in different places who've contributed some form of theorizing that we can sort of then work with and engage with. And the, the entries are put up with this short sort of biography or intro, uh, links to readings and then questions so that colleagues can either just literally transplant what we've put out there into their reading list, or they can point their students to them and say, look, I don't have time to do it in my course, but here's other material that you can consult and students can do that um, themselves. Another project I've been involved in, which you were referring to earlier, is the Connected Sociologies Curriculum Project. And that's an attempt to sort of create modules that, again, colleagues can just use to supplement their own teaching or to um, use the resources that are available on the site. And there we have colleagues providing short videos between 20 and 30 minutes addressing particular topics, again, providing mostly open access resources and questions which challenge the way in which we standardly understand this stuff. So we have one module on the making of the modern world that starts with the Haitian revolution, hmm. not with the industrial revolution or the French revolution, but with Haiti and sort of sets out why Haiti ought to be understood as a foundational world historical moment and, and so on. And so they're all trying to shift the curriculum and provide resources for the shifting of curricula, which I think uh, it, uh, you know, is going to be really important as part of these conversations. Thank you, yeah. So it, it really depends on us to, 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 get, to get to working. So I hope that everyone who's in the audience, and I see a lot of colleagues and professors, uh, that everyone takes it to heart and that we can start uh, constructing a new world for ourselves and, and inspire others.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bambra and, and Tommaso as well for a very inspiring talk uh, with a, a very concrete ideas and a concrete message. And, and we, we, can, we can start working now, I think, uh, on, on, on this and on decolonizing the world. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for the yeah. invitation. Thank you so much for your comments, Tomas. Really thanks, thanks a lot for your paper. It was fantastic.